and welcome back to Let's Talk Parks with Barry Dunn. It's Becky Dunlap here, and if you're new or if it's been a while since you heard an episode, uh, that's not on you, that's on me. It has been a really busy summer, and I'm just now trying to get back into the swing of things. So I'd like to reintroduce you to the podcast and to myself, just a little bit of background before we get into the show. My name is Becky Dunlap, and I am a Parks, Recreation, and Libraries Senior Consultant in Barry Dunn in the Local Government Practice Group. And we do all sorts of planning, master planning, strategic planning, feasibility studies for primarily local governments, municipal and uh, county governments, sometimes regional and beyond. And you may be asking, where have you been? Well, I have been finishing up the strategic plan for one of my very favorite clients, Evergreen Park Integration District in Colorado. And it's just been a fantastic plan. And as we reach the finish line, I just want to give my full attention to that, not to mention chasing around a three and a half year old and just trying to maintain my sense of, of work-life balance as, and I've just, I've had a commitment towards not working myself to burnout. That is my goal. I always try to remind myself that I have a long career ahead of me and it's just best to pace yourself. Even if it feels like everything's urgent, everything's important, the reality is that's just not the case. And sometimes we have to shift back and forth to the different things that matter to us. And sometimes that means dropping the ball. I feel like I dropped the ball on the podcast this summer, but hey, sometimes that just happens. And I think the best thing we can do is to brush it off and to move on and just to do the next right thing, to do the next right thing. And yes, I keep singing that song from Frozen 2 that tells you where my mind has been. Okay, so that only applies to parents of young children. So anyways, just wanted to preface the episode with that. All right, now let's get into it. So today I've got to tell you, Ryan Hegerness, I've always looked up to you. I saw him first speak. It was probably back in 2016. I think it was either, I think it was at NRPA and he was talking about marketing and technology and I instantly was intrigued. He has such a creative mind and is incredibly tech savvy. And so when you combine those different things with the decades of professional experience he has in the field of parks and recreation, it really is no surprise that he is a thought leader and has continued just to intrigue audiences of, and professionals around the country, not only in state conferences, but also nationwide. He has a great newsletter that he sends out. Maybe you found this episode through that newsletter. And I'm just always looking at what he's doing because I truly believe that he has a, a pulse on not only what's happening and what's trending right now, but what's what we should pay attention to in the future. And so it is my honor to have him on the show and to feature this episode around AI and technology. Now, again, I mentioned that the show has been a little bit postponed. So we recorded this back in June. And so in terms of technology, the world has shifted rapidly and it's almost like you have to record and, and post the same day in order for technology and AI to be relevant. This is a couple of months later. Just know that some things may not be as applicable as they were even a few months ago. But that being said, I'm still finding some people not even aware of what AI is or and how they can use it. And I think that so much of this absolutely still applies. So I will also add another caveat. Of course, check with your organization around what policies and guidelines they may have around artificial intelligence. I will say as this continues to evolve, more and more agencies are starting to adopt policies that may restrict access or the ability to utilize AI. And so, of course, that's something that you will have to manage and take responsibility for. And if you're in charge of creating those policies, we hope that you can look at this in a positive light because there are so many benefits that we can provide. And it is a matter of us being responsible and having some awareness around, okay, how can we utilize this for good? And and where is that line around the, the ethical dilemmas 
that we will continue to face as technology and artificial continues to to evolve and to and to be integrated into our lives. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let Ryan introduce himself, and then we're going to get into the rest of this episode and talk about tips and ideas for using AI for programs, facilities, marketing, and just in general how to maybe make your life just a little bit easier using AI. So here is Ryan, and um, in case you're not aware, he is the Deputy Director of Business Services at South Suburban Parks and Recreation. And now he's going to tell you a little bit more about his background and experiences in the field. I'm Ryan Hegrenis, and um, I'm a second-generation park and recreation professional. Uh, My parents were both park and rec professionals, and so I've grown up in the industry and had the opportunity now to work in five different states in parks and recreation. Um, I got my start in full-time parks and recreation right around the time that social media and online advertising were coming to the scene. And so I think what's given me a little bit of an opportunity in my my career is that I started in a small town in Vermont, Essex Junction, and did things at the time that I thought were just good business practices because through high school and college, I'd been doing websites and been a bit of an entrepreneur and had built some uh, different online advertising ventures. And so I started applying those things to what I was doing in local parks and recreation and not realizing that there weren't many doing those things at the time. And so that gave me an opportunity at an early age to talk a lot in the park and recreation industry about technology and and tools and uh, led to opportunities to take additional roles in, in uh, leading marketing for much larger communities. And uh, I am not a, a technology expert. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence today. And there are probably thousands or millions of people that are uh, in that industry that would be much more qualified on the specifics and and the technicalities of artificial intelligence. I think what I hope I bring to this conversation is more of a layperson, park and rec practitioner perspective of someone who's always been interested in technology and has been experimenting with AI for over the past year and share some of my perspectives on how it's been useful, where where I think it's going, what are some of those concerns? That's great, Brian. And I think the practical use of AI is really what's most valuable to our listeners today. So that's going to be perfect. So in your own words, let's talk about it. What is artificial intelligence? Can you just kind of give us a brief overview of what it is and what we should know before we dive into the specifics of how it applies to parks and recreation? Sure. Artificial intelligence can mean a lot of different things. I think right now, when you hear artificial intelligence, people are mostly talking about tools like ChatGPT and MidJourney, Dolly, and those fall into the category of gener- generative AI. And that's a specific category within artificial intelligence. The reality is artificial intelligence generally defined is really any type of technology that's performing work that looks like that that a human would do or looks like a human would do. And we've had AI in various ways for for years and years, and we've maybe not acknowledged it as such, but we've had AI tools for quite some time. Other definitions or words like machine learning is a category within AI of like, how do these machines learn? But um, I think what what the buzzword and, and the thing is that everyone's talking about now is um, the emergence of generative AI. And that's when you are conversing with the computer. You are uh, providing it a prompt and it is providing you with uh, responses or code or imagery or video. And you're having a dialogue with the machine. And so that's a generative AI. And then one more term that I will throw in there is when people like, are concerned about the future of AI and the existential threat of AI. Is this going to end the planet? That is the the concern there is not to be confused with generative AI, but artificial general intelligence. So AGI. And that's the idea that artificial intelligence is now at the level where it's thinking on its own and coming up with its own solutions. 
And we aren't there yet. So we'll, we'll be talking about tools like ChatGPT, um, GAI, not uh, AGI. So the difference might be that I can ask ChatGPT to perform a specific task and, and it'll do it. If I were uh, talking to artificial general intelligence that had a mind of its own, it wouldn't, I might ask it a question. And instead of it performing the task, it might tell me, I think you're asking the wrong questions. You should be looking at, and that's, that's that idea that. Uh, AI is now taking on a mind of its own. It has has its own thoughts, it, it maybe feelings and and things like that. So that just there's a spectrum of what AI can mean, and we're talking about generative AI predominantly today. Perfect, and I hope we get to talk about this, but just the importance of like developing solid prompts because it's just like anything else: garbage in, garbage out. If you're not asking the right question, hundred percent. Uh, then you're, you're not going to get the answer you're looking for. So, so in general, how do you see AI revolutionizing our work here in Parks and Rec? Sure. I think it's already, for some, uh, making a big difference in maybe how they do their work. And I've, I've spoken with other people in local government that are already using, uh, using this. And I'd, I'd say you ought to be using it with caution. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I think what's around the corner is, is potentially mind blowing. But uh, to your point about garbage in, garbage out, I'll, I'll provide an example. When I was first experimenting with chat GPT, and I guess to be specific, I was actually using the open AI playground, which is, which was a different tool than, than chat GPT and was experimenting with some prompts of how might I use this in the workplace. And first of all, You've got to ask the right questions. But secondly, I think it's important to realize that AI and, and generative AI is, is basically just math and algorithms providing you with, with information. And so it is providing you the best probable answer, not necessarily the right answer. So based on what you're asking it, it's, it's, it has access to trillions and trillions of pages of text and data and so forth. And so based on the question you're asking it, that algorithm is providing you something that is probable for what you are looking for, but not necessarily right. And so the example that I'll share is I started asking some budgetary questions. And at the time, chat GPT was limited to a data set from 2001 and earlier. But within the playground, you could, you could point it to existing data sources. And there are a lot of tools now uh, for AI that, that are on the open web and can access those other data sources. So I started asking it some budget questions about a park and recreation department. And it started giving me answers immediately. And I was blown away. Tell me how many staff this agency has. What is their budget for staffing? What is the cost recovery? All of these questions. And it's just immediately churning out answers. And they looked really good. They looked in, and they looked to me, someone who's even in the industry, they looked right. And, so, and then I started, but I'm like, I, I want to make sure. So I started asking it for the citations of where it was getting the information. And it was providing me with specific page numbers. Oh, on this budget document on this page. And so I, I thought, okay, this is actually real information. And so then I had it start comparing one agency to another and got these really useful insights. And I got really excited because I thought these are things that might take a business analyst a, a, a day. A, a recreation director might say, Hey, I want to know these 10 different things about the budget. And they're going to be crunching numbers and looking things up and take quite some time. And here it's spitting this information out immediately, which is really exciting. But then I started opening those documents myself and looking at the numbers and realizing that it gave me information that looked right, but it wasn't actually factual information. So that's where we are right now with, with AI and the exciting thing is we're right around the corner from those types of problems being solved. But that's the, the big challenge with, with AI right now and the tools that most people are using is it's, it's giving you information that 
um, may look right, but may not actually be right. And so they're starting to build tools. I was just using the, the Bing, uh, Microsoft Bing AI the other day, and that will now tell you exactly what it's searching for to answer your question and then provide citations, which I think is really important. Another example is I thought, well, this could be a really good tool for someone that's looking for a job. So at the time I, I asked, show me executive level park and recreation jobs in Western states with salaries over X and provide the job title, the uh, a brief synopsis of the job and the pay range. And boom, it spits out 10 different job opportunities theoretically that are open in the area that meet those specific criteria. And, and think you might be, it might be someone that's fresh out of college and has an interest in natural resources and says, find me entry level jobs, natural resources that pay within this range or within this state and how useful that might be. Um, and I also asked it to provide a link to the job posting and it did. Some of those links were actual links to job postings and some of them were completely fabricated. So that's the caution is it's not only garbage in, garbage out of asking wrong prompts, but right now you might be giving it a great prompt, but you still need to verify the information. And I think as the tools get more sophisticated and some of these, the term people use is hallucinations of AI just fabricating things that aren't actually true. As that problem gets solved, the tools will be even more useful. Right now, where I see it being incredibly useful is for idea generation, for, for research, and for helping with writing, writing style, grammar, things like that, and being able to generate useful text, maybe not as a final product, but as a, as a uh, fast starting point. Well, that's so helpful. Thanks for sharing that. I also think that idea generation and brainstorming, it's so helpful. You can just continue to ask it questions, but you're right. It, it will present information in a way that seems very factual. You can't tell from the tone of <laughs> of what it's giving back to you as to whether or not it's accurate or not. So mm -hmm. there takes a good amount of fact checking if you decide to use it in the, some of the ways that you were just describing. Right. Um, this uh, may, may be a good time. You, you mentioned idea generation. And one example of that is uh, a few months ago, uh, another park and recreation professional reached out to me. They are hiring their first marketing or communication related position. And they wanted to know if I had a set of good interview questions that they, they might be able to, to utilize for that role. And I asked some specifics. Okay. Well, what specifically will this position be doing? And I was able to share, um, some interview questions that we had used previously, but I also went to chat GPT and, and the, my prompt was something to the effect of you are the hiring manager for a local park and recreation district that's hiring a marketing position to do the following functions, blah, 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 blah. What are 10 interview questions that you would ask to ascertain the candidate's compatibility for the job? Something like that, right? And then immediately gave 10 questions. And then that, you can ask it again and get 10 different questions. And some of them were really good. And so I was able to provide this person with here's some questions we've used and here's 20 more questions that chat GPT generated specific to the job functions that you're looking for. Now, I wouldn't suggest just taking that straight into the interview and using that for the interview, but now you've got 30, 40 interview questions, potential interview questions, very specific to that role that you can choose from and say, okay, what makes sense for me to use? Or maybe I'll tweak this question a little bit to make it more relevant. And that's something that, you know, in, in five to 10 seconds, you get that output versus when the past or for these roles, you might go online and search for, for interview questions, or you may be reaching out to a colleague and that may take a considerable amount of time to get that information. And here you've got it in a matter of seconds. I just love that it solves the the blank page syndrome, right? Where right. you're just like, what do I write? Where do I start? And you really don't need to have that problem anymore. 
one quick tip that you mentioned in there is around telling chat GPT who they are, right? You are a, you are hiring manager or you are a parks and recreation director or you are someone who creates programs in parks and rec. And it just, it helps to provide the framework. Yeah. Another yeah. one might be you are writing a grant application for and, and it, really anything, but think of, but telling it, here's the role, here's the context. You're writing a grant. You, you are a grant writer for a local municipal park and recreation agency versus like you're writing a grant for a major national healthcare chain. The more specificity that you can give, the better and more applicable the response will be. Right. And how useful is that they can't how like, a parks and recreation professional. You have to put on all these different hats, right? There's all these different jobs. So just maybe by outsourcing that, even for idea generation is a great start. Mm -hmm. So why is AI such a hot topic right now? It's a hot topic for a number of reasons. And it's funny, I, I got in my car this morning and they were talking about AI. And yesterday I got in my car and they were talking about AI. I was listening to a podcast before that and they were, it was, it was a topic. Um, I think because it is evolving so fast um, and that these tools are now available to the public and, and it's starting to, um, to change the way that people are working. Um, unfortunately, in, in some instances, and one of the concerns, I think we'll, we'll talk about some of the, the concerns and maybe ethical dilemmas. Um, some people are already reporting that they're losing their jobs to, to AI. Um, and, the bigger concern that you hear a lot of tech executives talking about is they're actually scared because of how fast it's moving and there really is no regulation right now. And it's not so much a concern for where we are in the moment, though I think there are some, some significant ethical or legal things that need to be worked out, but we see how fast technology evolves. And if we're, if we've gone from where we were a year or two ago, where nobody was talking about AI in this way to now everybody's using it. It's getting smarter day by day. Every iteration that they come out with is, is more advanced. I, I heard recently that they, they would, in general, artificial intelligence is thought to have an IQ of about 145, which is significantly smarter than, than most people. <laughs> Einstein was what, like, a, I think 160 or something, right? So, and that's not, there's, it's diff different from in different contexts, but uh, I saw another chart recently that showed for, for different industries, different verticals, like how, how quickly AI was surpassing the, the average person in law or you know, the, the AI is passing the bar exam. It, it used to be that it could generate text or, or do grammatical checking and things, but it may not be as good as a human. And now it's better than humans in they looked at all these different, and it's just moving so fast. Those lines are, are going vertical so quickly that the concern is how do we put the right boundaries around this? Whether you are someone who thinks that this is some existential crisis, that artificial intelligence is going to be the end of, of humankind, or whether you're just concerned about people using it for the wrong reasons, even the technology today being used for the wrong reasons for misinformation, for misleading people, for, for hacking, for fraud, all of these different potential use cases, like any technology could be used for good or it could be used for bad. And the ability of these tools to, to be so proficient can give both people using it for positive reasons and those who may have malicious intent, the ability to be that much more powerful. So I think that's why it's such a hot topic. And you hear a lot of executives from, from it within the AI industry calling for regulation, but I don't really know that the government, our lawmakers ha have a, a handle on AI to really even know where to begin or what that looks like and, and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, those are all good points. I know we don't want to talk about concerns. You touched on it a little bit. I think from a, a personal perspective, it almost feels like, well, there are a lot of unknowns, but if I don't explore how to use it the best of my own ability, which is what we're going to talk about today, how you can use it in your jobs, then 
the whole concern around, well, will it take my job? We can't just live in that fear. We have to figure out how to get ahead of that and start researching and planning. So at least we know how to use the tools that are available to us right now. Yeah. A, a quote I came across recently and I wrote it down. It was, this is from Mo Gaudet, who is a former Google executive and involved in AI and uh, recently did a, a podcast with, I think, Stephen Bartlett that received a lot of attention because he's he has an alarmist view about AI and where it's heading. So I guess I, hey, I'd, I'd encourage people to maybe check that out. And then on the other end of the spectrum, in the same week, I saw a an article by Mark Andreessen, who's also a, a tech executive, Silicon Valley venture capitalist. And his take is why AI is going to save the world. So there's two different perspectives. <laughs> no, it's going to save the world. It's going to end the world. But But Mo said, AI will not take your job. A person using AI will take your job. And I think, especially right now, um, I think that's, that, that's a quote for like in the moment, like AI is probably not going to take your job before somebody who's become proficient in utilizing AI to be that much more effective at the work that you're doing. Your, your job might be replaced by somebody who can do your job and two other people's because they're more efficient in that. Uh, and we've seen that happen before with te technology advances. And But I think there's some bigger concerns when it comes to AI and how many jobs or what those might be. That's really interesting. And that's a really good point. So that's why we're going to get ahead of some of this today and explore some of those solutions. But do you have any concerns that you personally have impacts to the field that could be negative too? Sure. A few more, kind of more, maybe more ethical than legal so one, one, one of the first AI technologies that I experimented with was some of the image generation platforms. And there were, there are a couple concerns there. So in this, like similar, but different from chat GPT, chat GPT has, has access to trillions and trillions of pages of, of text and information, and it will put together a probable text based solution. Um, with tools like Mid Journey or Dolly, um, you're providing it a prompt and it's creating imagery for you. And it's pulling from, um, having viewed, scanned, whatever you want to call it, millions and millions of images that are out there. So if I ask for a picture of someone sitting under an umbrella at the beach, it knows generally what someone sitting under an umbrella at the beach looks like and will generate an original image. But that image is based off of other artwork. And so there have been professional artists who have said, Hey, this looks an awful lot like artwork that I've created. And so the, the legal debate there is, should these engines be using professionally created work as part of their, I guess, knowledge base, if you will. And then that may be showing up in some form or fashion in these images that are being created. How how does this impact the art industry? Should they be compensated? Should artists have the ability to specify whether or not AI has access to that information as a user of, a, of an image generated? What are my rights or do I have liability if, if it's using someone else's copyrighted work? Where does fair use come into all of this? That's, that's one of those um, eth ethical concerns. And you might say maybe perhaps maybe some of the same might apply to chat GPT and where it's pulling information from. Uh, another concern is, and going back to the garbage in, garbage out, any human biases that we have when it comes to the information that, that we've produced or the art that we've produced is also going to be uh, influenced in the AI output that we received. So whether that's just like what what is what, what is truth there's so much information disinformation was such a hot topic so where where is it pulling that information from and is that what are the biases that are that are impacting that output or when it comes to image generation for example this was not maybe nine months ago and maybe it's changed but i noticed that if i asked uh, one of these tools for image of a business a businessman in a suit. Typically, it, the images it would generate for me were 
white, right? And and if I wanted any kind of diversity in the imagery that I was that it was generating, I would have to specify that, right? So some of those those biases just in the information that's available on the internet of whatever that prompt you may be seeking is also going to, to come into that. So I think being cognizant of that is important an important consideration. I'm sure there are a lot of other potential ethical concerns. We've talked a bit about the jobs and the, how that may may replace jobs and what does that mean. I think the bigger one is just people's intent in using it. So I think there are individuals who've lost jobs now, you hear are a lot of uh, people generating content for like these these blogs and news sites that are just churning out junk articles anyway, right? So if your job is churning out 20 junk articles a day for some some news site and AIs now can generate junk articles, then I think there's a race to the bottom. Like, oh, well, now we can now mass produce bad content versus like someone who really cares about a subject and has subject matter expertise or is a journalist and is actually, I think there's a lot of ways in which there may be more of a need for that, that strong human touch to things. But if you're just looking to create articles to get clicks, then I think that's where we're seeing some of that job loss. But I think that's going to shift as AI gets better and smarter and uh, more reliable. I Right now, I don't see many park and recreation jobs being replaced. I mean, we're such a, a human service in person. I don't, I don't think that we're going to have event planners suddenly lose their job to chat GPT. But, and this might be a good experiment that we could do. I've done this before. Think of an event that uh, maybe an unusual event that you might be asked to put on in the community and you can tell chat GPT you're the event planner for a particular community or a community of 50,000 people located in, in the South and you're asked to produce such and such an event. Um, what are some ideas for an event theme or a schedule of events or activities? And it'll put a whole event together for you. Some of it may not be what you're looking for at all, but some of it you'll say, oh, that's a really good idea. I think I want to run with that. Right, exactly. You still have to have the discernment to figure out if it's right for you and your agency, but it gives you a good start. And I have also experimented with, okay, here's the idea. Now build me a plan. Like for the next three months, what are the different steps I need to take in order to get to actually executing on this event that we have? Yeah. And and then another one might be more on the communication side. You could ask it to generate a social media strategy for you and it will, it, it can create the post. It can create the schedule. It could tell you, here's what you should post on Facebook versus, Inst you know, all of that. Um, and there's still a need, I think, someone with a marketing and communications background is going to do a better job. But if you're a small agency that doesn't have someone with that expertise, the ability to have this tool help you by creating some draft posts and some suggestions for types of content that you can create is going to go a long way compared to just trying to figure it out on your own or or maybe just not do something because you don't have that ability or that someone with that background in-house. Right, exactly. Like if you don't know where to start, just start asking questions. And I was remembering back to a, a, a presentation you did at a conference. You were talking about an event that you did where it was like some sort of scavenger hunt and eggs. And like, I don't remember. Do you remember that? Yeah, I, 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 we've used that example a number of times that we had an ongoing campaign called the Stanley Monster and people would go out on our trail system and discover these glass eggs, these collectible handmade glass eggs is and it was a way to encourage people to get out on the trail system but the whole campaign to generate interest in that was intricate and very fun and clever and a lot of unique uh, ways to to get the community involved right okay so to me like that's human ingenuity you can't can't replace it but if you know of ideas like that or you want to do a scavenger hunt for instance like that's something that ChatGPT can plan out for you. And, and, you know, as unique as that campaign was, 
It was a copy of something else. I think there's very little originality. You know, I think, man, it was over a decade ago, but someone that I looked up to in the park and recreation profession, Barry Weiss was speaking at a conference and he would always talk about the case method, C-A-S-E, copy and steal everything. And I think we don't have to endeavor to come up with these absolutely brilliant novel concepts. We can look to what other people are doing inside our industry or outside and then put our own spin on it. So that seemingly monster was a spin off of something that was being done in Eugene, Oregon. We've made it very, very different, but the idea came from there. And so similarly with tools like ChatGPT, like you said, it can be a springboard to give you a bunch of ideas, and then you can put your own kind of human creativity and ingenuity to make that idea more of your own. Awesome. Well, I love this topic. Let's dive in and be really specific and talk about programs first. So some of the things that come to mind, we already mentioned a little bit, but just brainstorming, brainstorming new programs for new age groups um, or different types of unique programs that might work in your community based off of perhaps your demographics or perhaps your current users. You could also use ChatGPT to help you plan out programs and understand the different components like timing, schedules, et cetera. Um, and then also just thinking about your program guide and de- maybe developing program descriptions. It's like, how can you reinvent those to be maybe more intriguing to your audience? But Ryan, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you around how else could we use AI for programs. You mentioned generating program descriptions. I did a a brief video that I posted on LinkedIn earlier this year, and it was comparing chat GPT generated program descriptions with program descriptions from gold met NRPA gold medal winning agencies. And this was not to be a, a slam on the agencies because honestly, we're all in the same boat with the program descriptions that we create. And I was a programmer for many years and did the same thing. But the observation was we don't give a lot of thought to the program descriptions that we're writing. And chat GPT was creating better program descriptions than most of what I was finding um, in these activity guides. But with a little bit of intentionality about how we go about writing a program description, I think we can do a better job than ChatGPT, um, but I think ChatGPT could be a great tool, um, again, to maybe find some new ways to talk about the same program you've been talking about for, for 10 years, or maybe uh, new ways to retheme or rethink that program so it, it's a little bit different. Another thing that I think on the programming side is... I think some agencies do a good job at this and others, we just do the same program that, that we've always done. And if it gets enrollment, great. But I think we'll be getting to a place where artificial intelligence will be able to better help us assess what programs are working and which ones aren't or when it comes to cost recovery and things like that, rather than, you know, once a year running some kind of cost recovery analysis and having a conversation about why didn't this art class get the numbers that it needed or make the revenue that it needed to have more of that in um, real time or, or better assessment of was it because of the time of day or is it the instructor? Those are, those are things that we can do now, but it takes work to figure out. And I think that those types of tasks might be things that AI will do in the future to help us take data from registration, take data from our surveys from our customers and help us better analyze what we're doing and make recommendations for how it could be better. I love that idea. I love that idea, Ryan. And I think it makes perfect sense that some of the data analysis that we spend so much time on, both as a consultant, but also I know for professionals, is trying to figure out, well, what matters here and how can we use this data for decision making? And so if that was already built into the softwares that professionals use on a daily basis, then that would be really beneficial and helpful and a huge time saver. Another idea that you made me think of is just around our, the idea of website optimization. But I would love to see Parks Recreation Agencies utilize 
a tool or some sort of quiz or survey where when someone comes onto your website, they're able to fill out a couple of questions around the age group that they're looking for or what they're trying to learn or their availability and interests. And I think being able to make something incredibly user-friendly, it's just a gap for us. I think we need to stop assuming that people know how to navigate our intricate systems and instead base them on what people would intuitively do, which they can answer questions about themselves, but oftentimes it's harder for them to know how to navigate your website and find the exact filter they need in order to find the program that they're looking for. So that's just an idea. I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I love that idea. I think uh, a lot of the software out there right now can be pretty painful for a parent to try to find something when you might be able to filter it by an age or by a topic, but you're doing a lot of work to filter and sort that information. And if it were just simply a chat bot on the site and you said, I have a very active four-year-old that's interested in X, Y, and Z, what programs do you have? Or I have an active four-year-old and I, I want to get them into some sports and we're only available on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays after 5 p.m. And for that to th just immediately tell you, oh, you might be interested in our gymnastics class at, it's on Tuesday and Thursday at six versus having to spend 10 minutes trying to find that on your own. Exactly. I mean, I, I can't wait to see the day when we can just enter in a prompt into websites and out pops the best programs for our specific needs. I think that that is the future. Who knows? What do you think? Is that a couple of months out, a couple of years out? What do you think? I think that the technology is there or very close, but I think as we've always seen, we will see and we're already seeing solutions like that in the private sector. And local government will be on the tail end of implementing those types of solutions and probably having those built into the software that we use. Agreed. Well, we may not be the first ones or the trendsetters, but at least we can hopefully get there one day. Yeah. When it comes to, comes to programming, another thing that it may be helpful to do is, and I've done this before, is ask for examples from other communities. So rather than just like, what are some program ideas? If you're asked to put on a, a eco fest, you could ask it, what are five other communities that are doing an eco fest and provide me a brief description of the event. Again, it, it goes back to that prompt, M make, make your prompt as good as you can so that it does as much work for you as, as possible. Provide me a link to their event page and et cetera, et cetera. Right, exactly. If you can narrow down on what you want to explore, that does wonders for the output that you get. All right, well, we'll get into facilities next. When I think about facilities, I, I think less in terms of this generative AI like ChatGPT or image generation, some of the like the hot topic right now. And I think more along the lines of the... the existing technologies, um, automation technologies, or the internet of things. And I think there's so many things already, things like whether it's the climate control and optimizing your systems within a facility to scheduling or, or access controls, et cetera. A lot of that you might be, be right to lump into the category of artificial intelligence. I think there's some really interesting things that some of the some of the private sector is working on where they're using machine learning to study the equipment within a facility and using artificial intelligence to assess, let, let's say it, I'm not a mechanical person by any means. So we'll say it's like a air conditioning unit or it could be a motor or something. And with AI having studied maybe hundreds or thousands of that same motor in terms of the some of the things that it might be able to study are the revolutions per minute or the vibration and things like that, that it's able to predict based on the that motor's behavior, what kind of maintenance it may need preemptively or what kind of a particular failure is or the likelihood of it because it's studied that that same motor and those same outputs and can see those signals of a potential problem 
or a potential maintenance or safety issue before a human might and be able to flag that for preventative maintenance. So I think there's some kind of cool applications of AI in that way. I think there's just so much potentially already when it comes to aquatics and chemicals and measuring and balancing and things like that. I, I remember growing up in aquatics and every however a couple hours you're scooping the water and putting the drops in and you're looking to see, okay, what shade of red is this? And then what adjustments do I need to make? Versus a computer doing probably a much better assessment of that and then making those adjustments. Right. I think that we're probably at the stage of we're collecting or we're starting to collect all of this data and then it will help to have AI start to interpret that information. Right. Um, For instance, with mobility data, right, from something like we're using Placer AI. Mm Mm-hmm. And so just to understand which days have the highest visitation, what times have the highest visitation. Right. (laughs) Or even within the facility, what rooms are underutilized. And again, that's info that we we could have or you may have. But I think for for a lot of departments, that's maybe not as actionable because somebody has to then look at this and analyze and having that information right there at your fingertips, I think will help us make better decisions faster. Right. Yeah, absolutely agree. So Ryan, when you think about the customer experience, which you've already touched on a little bit with websites, programs, and facilities, but tell us a little bit more about how AI can assist with the customer experience. I think the customer experience is something that that can mean a lot of different things. So we already talked a little bit about how we could improve the customer's experience for a parent looking for a program on your website and how AI might um, be able to help you find information more quickly or more personalized to your specific needs. So rather than putting the burden on the user to sort through the information, the user can provide a description of what their needs are, what they're looking for, and get that output. I think other ways that AI could help improve user experience is right now, We, an agency may be collecting a lot of survey data, but, but may not be taking action on some of that data. And I'm thinking back to one of my first jobs. And when I started, there were stacks of paper surveys and like after every program, parents were filling out a paper survey, but then that paper survey was sitting in a stack somewhere until somebody either just read through it. And I think that maybe was what happened in the past. And just relied on your own memory or feeling after reading a hundred of those surveys of what people wanted, and then taking that data and actually typing it into the computer um, and putting it into Excel and then being able to make some decisions based on that. And then taking the next step, well, well, let's skip that step and have an online survey and get that data to make decisions. But I, I think a lot of times we collect that information and whether it's sitting on a paper stack on the desk or whether it's sitting in a database on your computer, are you actually going through that to try to make informed uh, decisions or not? And it takes effort. And it want, something that I would I did, we had so much survey lesson data and we were able to plot that and do a heat map where I could see um, trends based on maybe who a particular instructor was that was consistently getting lower scores. And you would never pick up on that if you're just thumbing through the surveys or if it was a particular time of day, or are we offering this class for younger children too early in the morning when it's cold? And that's why the scores are lower. Like you don't know those things unless you analyze that data. And you can do that for a program or two, but can you do that for everything across the board? Probably not, but could AI? Certainly. So I think, and that's helping you improve your customer experience by making better informed decisions. There may be other ways that AI could help make those better customer decisions as well. But I I think collecting user input and then help having it help you make actionable decisions for your customers in whatever way that looks like is probably the biggest key there. Awesome. So for our final part of this episode, we're going to be talking about marketing and communications. We know historically that agencies are underfunded and understaffed when it comes to marketing. And so we think this is the prime opportunity to utilize AI to fill in for some of those gaps. 
Ryan, tell me, what should we be thinking about when it comes to marketing, communications, copywriting, social media, et cetera? And how can we use AI to improve what we do in that area? So, well, I, you mentioned copywriters, and I, I think you're absolutely right. But in the context of parks and recreation, how many true copywriters does any park and recreation ad- agency actually have? Um, maybe one, maybe two, if you're a large agency, if you're fortunate, right? Um, but who's writing most of the copy? Um, you know, your program descriptions are being written by programmers who are not copywriters or, or marketers or journalists or anything like that, right? And so I think that's a huge opportunity to do a better job of communicating. And this is not taking anyone's job. This is just doing the work you're already doing and making it better. And I'll, I'll give an example. Recently, a colleague forwarded me a news release, a blog post from another community, and I won't say the community. And it was, this was in the winter time, and it was about their snow removal policy and like educating the community about what they do for snow removal. But it was very clearly written by like an engineer. And there was a lot of jargon and, and like industry terminology. And it was, it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great for like a community facing piece. And so I copied that text and dropped it into chat GPT and said, rewrite this so a fifth grader could understand it. And in, in 10 seconds, I had a better version of the article that was, would be better for someone in the community to read. And then you can have fun with that as well. And maybe you want it in a particular tone. I wouldn't recommend either of these, but just texting this back and forth with a friend. So after I got the the better version, I asked chat GPT to rewrite that and you could pick anybody rewrite this in the style of and pick somebody with a particular like notable speaking style or writing style. So the two I did, I, I asked it to rewrite it as if it was Ted Lasso. And, and then, and again, the specificity there, I didn't just say rewrite this as, as Ted Lasso. I said, rewrite this as Ted Lasso and include some analogies like Ted Lasso would use. And so then it provides you a much more playful um, explanation of your snow removal. And you know, I don't remember specifically, but it, was, it may have been something like uh, snow removal reminds me of when I was a kid playing with matchbox cars in the sandbox. So you're like, it, it's coming up with like some creative Tad Les- Ted Lasso like way to explain snow removal. Or, and not to get political, but someone else with a very distinct speaking style, Donald Trump. So I'd I'd asked it to rewrite it in that style. And it came out with something to the effect of, we have the, we have incredible snow removal policy. We have the best snow plow drivers in the country, right? And just like, it's that quick to rewrite it in a particular style. So if you want to have maybe a more playful tone with something or yours, reaching a specific audience, you can take something from an engineer or from a subject matter expert and not only make it easier to read, but come up with some ideas for maybe a better way to describe something or a more playful way to communicate the message. This may not be quite marketing communication, but I want to make sure I mention this. Um, The idea of utilizing it for like prototyping as well. Um, So my brother is an artist and an engineer and and uh does a lot of really creative stuff and he had a new business idea and he sent me some mock-ups of some some models of what he was thinking of creating and i was like wow these are really cool this is really impressive like how did you create i I thought he was using cad software to come up with these very specific models of uh, some new art he wanted to make and no he just was using mid journey and giving it very specific prompts and refining those prompts until he got exactly what he was looking for. And, um, rather than having to learn how to do 3d modeling on a computer and, um, spend months trying, trying to figure it out in a matter of minutes, he's generating these, these models. And the same could be true for if you're looking to generate a logo or something like that. I think you, the I of a graphic designer and their skill sets still going to be necessary but the idea of generating 20 different ideas um, and thinking outside of the box 
and then using that as a, a launch pad, bringing this back to that marketing and communication angle um, is a is an opportunity. Um, oh, 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 I should definitely mention Photoshop now has, have you seen this, Becky, the, the tools of Photoshop has um, the ability within a, within a picture, you're doing graphic design, and I'm not a graphic designer, but I've seen a lot of examples of this online where now it has the these abilities built in. So you could have a picture, I'm looking at you right now and you have a backdrop of, of a, a bridge. I've seen that bridge. I don't remember which bridge that is. Um, but you've got some trees and a bridge in your background. And if I if that were an image on Photoshop, I could prop the tree out on the right hand side and just tell Photoshop to put in a skyscraper. And boom, there's a realistic looking skyscraper. And then I could ask it to put sunglasses on you. And then I could say, no, not those glasses and cycle through 20 different pairs of sunglasses. And then I could ask it to change the bridge into the Eiffel Tower. And the ability to manipulate images uh, is giving designers just such a, a more expansive tool set to, you may not get the perfect shot that you want, but you can turn it into the, the perfect shot or to extend the background of an image and AI will create, generate a realistic looking background to extend a picture. It's, it's really mind blowing. And I think it's really changing maybe what's real, what's fake, what can we trust? Like there's definitely some concerns there, but those tools are now at, at people's fingertips and, and the tools that they're already using. We're going to see more and more of those AI tools being built into our web browser, built into our apps, built into Microsoft Word or the, the software that you're using every day as a maybe a much more usable version. I don't know if you were around for a Microsoft's Clippy little assistant right. way back in what is it, the late 90s or something, <laughs> and but a much more sophisticated assist, virtual assistant built into the tools that we're already using every day. Absolutely. And two examples of that. At one, Canva. I know a lot of people use that. They have an AI generator for images. And then two, Microsoft Designer is their version of this um, AI generated images. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's important to point out any tool that just makes it as easy as possible, something to, to be aware with and experiment with. And I think even if it's just for you personally or your staff to start to visualize like the future of your parks or a recreation center and just to use that as concepts, there's just a lot of potential for it. So definitely, I think it's going to change the way when it comes to like park planning or facility planning and generating concepts or models or, or images of what a park could be. I, I think that's another useful application uh, that we'll see. Yeah, I think so too. So we covered a lot today, programs, facilities, customer experience, some marketing. What do you think overall, like what would be your closing statement to the world, the parks and recreation field when it comes to using AI to improve the work that we're doing? That's a lot of pressure. Uh, I, I think my closing statement would be just get out, experiment with these tools. They're relatively easy to use, easy to access. And whether it's something that you plan to use day to day or not, I think it's important to be knowledgeable because it's going to be more and more prevalent in the workplace. And I think the sooner that people get a handle for what uh, what's possible and what's possible now, what may be possible in the future and how we can better leverage those tools to better serve our communities and to be more efficient uh, I think that would be my closing statement is just test some of these out and see. And, you know, it's not, these are tools that I'm using on a day-to-day a -day basis, but they're tools that, you know, for specific problems or for inspiration or for research has changed the way I do work. So rather than me opening 20 or 30 browser tabs, as I usually will to try to research a topic and understand it, I can use chat GPT to do that research for me and synthesize it. So I think for me, that's probably right now the the main way that I'm use, using it is more for like researching information and getting inspiration and being a lot more efficient about it. So just try those tools out. There's 
so many and there there will continue to be more. And I think it's it's exciting. And and I also share in some of the concern as well of where this goes in the future and how do we get the right the right boundaries on AI so that it continues to be a useful tool for for good, but also doesn't create more problems for society because we have enough of those as it is. Yes, we do. We certainly have enough problems. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Would you mind telling people where they can find out more information about you and some of the work that you're doing? So I wear multiple hats and uh, one of those is I do some occasional speaking and consulting work here and there. And I do that. My, my website is hegrinus.net. And I've been sending an, an email newsletter for over a decade now. And I send that on a monthly basis, although I had some setbacks this past month. But right now it's a, a monthly newsletter and it highlights anything that I find interesting from parks and recreation to technology artificial intelligence. I always include a, a book recommendation and some of the recent articles or, or books that I've been reading. So if you're interested, you can subscribe to that. There's a link at hegrinus.net as well as every book and any anything that I've done in the last 10 years should be available in some form or fashion there. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, plug that, Becky. You're very welcome. Ryan, thanks for everything you've done for the field. Thanks for your time today. It was a real pleasure. And for those of you listening, thanks for tuning in today. Please share this episode with anyone who might be interested in the subject of AI and just the future of technology and innovation in the field of parks and recreation. That's all for today's episode. Thanks very much for tuning in. And until next time, let's talk parks. Bye.